Atlanta, Georgia, 1979. One by one, kids are going missing, with no explanation. There was a real-life monster on the loose. But nearly 40 years later, this case has left more questions than answers. From the producers of Up and Vanished and How Stuff Works, we present an all-new podcast, Atlanta Monster. Subscribe to Atlanta Monster right now on Apple Podcasts and be the first to hear it on January 5th. Get in touch with technology with Tech Stuff from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to Tech Stuff. I am your host, Jonathan Strickland. I'm an executive producer here at How Stuff Works, and joining me today is Mr. Scott Benjamin. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be here. And Scott, I always like to ask you in so that uh, whenever I'm doing a show that has to do with like vehicles, because of course everyone knows you as like the the incredibly uh, insightful, wise expert in all things vehicular. Or at least you you got enough of a basis to get the rest of us all buzzing because our heads are just totally (laughs) stuffed with nonsense. I just fake it. You know what? You do it better than anyone else I know. So I had to have you on the show. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. I promise I am not going to break your heart in this episode. Wow. I know. know, It's a change. I was just talking about that with Ramsey, our producer, that uh, (laughs) I'm waiting for that gotcha moment. Yeah, I'm not doing that this time. I uh, people who have been listening to tech stuff, you know that in past episodes, I I have found ways to have little moments where I I can actually sit across the table and watch Scott's heartbreak right in front of my eyes. Uh, <laughs> well, it's all in good fun, and yeah. you know what? I was I was waiting for it, but I, I figured you know like, well, uh, what's he really going to break my heart about with this topic? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of uh, I wouldn't say I'm in, I'm not indifferent to this, but. Um, I really don't have a whole lot of personal experience with with this type I, of vehicle. I'd say that this 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 whole world is a little outside of our tax bracket. Oh, yeah, I would yeah. say uh, far outside of our tax bracket. We're talking about personal submarines today. Now, before we jump into the world of personal submarines, which is pretty fascinating and also head scratching. I mean, we're going to be talking about not just stuff that you could, in theory, go out and buy if you had let's call it a metric crap ton of money, Mm -hmm. but also some stuff that, as far as we can tell, has yet to actually exist in any real form, right? Sure. Um, I had actually mentioned on Twitter uh, earlier today, the day we're recording this is on on January 19th, 2018, and I had mentioned that one of the things that's perplexing and frustrating covering this kind of technology is that when you start covering tech at a certain luxury level, you frequently will encounter examples of, where you see lots of concept art, but you don't see any evidence of anyone actually making anything. Yeah, and we've got a good example of that that we're going to share with you today. Yeah. So before we go into that, I wanted to give you guys a bit of the history of the development of the submarine, because it's a fascinating one, and it's centuries old. And uh, I mostly wanted to do this so that, Scott, you and I can have little discussions about this, too. I can tell you some facts. If you have any questions or anything that I happen to know the answer to, we can chat about that. But just also uh, just hearing about the ingenuity and in some cases uh, insanity of the people who decided to go and try and make stuff that would go underwater and let them live there. <laughs> uh, definite insanity. I don't know a whole lot about the history of, of submarines, I'll have to admit. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to be teaching me some new things, and I'm sure I'll have some questions along the way. Sure. So where would you like to start? Well, we're going to start in the 16th century. Whoa. Yeah, this would be around the time that Shakespeare is writing stuff. Actually, wow. this is technically before, because we're going to go all the way back to 1578. When William Bourne, who was an English innkeeper and a little bit of an eccentric dreamer, decided to put some of his ideas together in book format, he published a book titled Inventions and Devices and included all sorts of ideas, including a boat that he imagined that would be able to go under the water, thus a a submarine. Now, he knew, as did plenty of people before him, that solid matter will displace a volume of water equal to that solid objects weight, right? Mm -hmm. You put something in a body of water, it's going to displace the water uh, by a volume that's equal to the weight of the object. Sure. Everyone had known that for millennia, but Born, maybe millennia is exaggerating, but for hundreds of years, Born went further. He said, boats float because of that property. And if the boat were to take on water, 
it would technically be displacing less water than what it weighed because it's actually bringing water into the form of the boat itself and that's what would cause a boat to sink. So boats sink because they end up displacing less water than what they weigh and then because of that ratio, they plummet to the bottom of the ocean. Got it. Or rivers or but, lakes or whatever. But the problem with that is that you're in the boat. Yeah, there, it turns out that uh, sailors hate it when this happens. <laughs> they, they're they not big fans of it. But yeah. he, he said, if you could control this in some way and keep the water separate from, you know, the people in the boat, then you could possibly go under the water and that there could be all sorts of potential applications for that, particularly as would turn out to be the case, military applications. Mm -hmm. And so he came up with this idea uh, that he didn't, he never built as far as we know, but he came up with an idea that he proposed could work, which involved having a, a boat made out of wood uh, that is completely covered, right? You then cover the wood with special treated leather to waterproof the boat. Okay. So it's watertight and so water's not going to come in. Fantastic technology at the time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the the leather itself would be attached to the boat with uh, a device where you could loosen the leather or tighten it against the boat and thus allow water to seep in between the leather and the exterior of the boat. Oh, very clever. Yeah. So you can start to displace less water. You're taking water on almost as ballast. Like a movable bladder of sorts. Yes, exactly. And then that would allow you to sink under the water. And then you would be able to tighten it again to expel water and regain buoyancy and come mm. back up. Uh, he said that this, he thought, would probably work pretty well. He even thought about air because he said, well, you know, uh, that's going to be an issue. He said what would the, the boat would also have a mast in the center that mm. would extend up and go through the surface of the water at the top. So you would have sort of like a snorkel poking out. All the time. You would never submerge to the point where the mast itself would go under the surface of the water. I see. Is this a, is, is, so it's hollow in some way. Yes, so it's, it's got it a, bo a whole board in the middle. Okay, got yeah. it. And uh, he actually wrote uh, a, a, a very helpful sentence to explain his rationale. He said, For the hole that goeth through the mast must give you air, as men cannot live without it. Truer words were never spoken. Uh, so <laughs> Bourne was really smart, I guess. Yeah. Now, sometime later, there was a drawing that surfaced that some would ascribe to his his actual description, but it may have also just been drawn by someone else with a similar idea. Uh, this one is one, if you ever see it, it looks like a boat that has uh, two segments on the side that are on screws, and if you turn the screws one way, it pulls them inward to the boat, allowing water to come into certain chambers that are sealed off from the rest of the boat. I see. And if you turn the screws the other way, it pushes the panels back to be flush with the boat. Uh, but according to all the resources I was looking at, they said that that was a different enough design from what Bourne had been describing in his book that it's quite possible it was drawn by someone else, but dates to around the same time. You know what's funny? If if you had asked me this question, uh, you know, without telling me who it was that, that created the sub, the first submarine, yeah, uh, I would have credited this to Leonardo da Vinci. Sure. I think most people would think that that was the mind that created something like this because, I mean, he has so many other uh, just incredible, spectacular inventions that, that later were built and functional. Well, I mean, he proposed the air screw, which was essentially a predecessor to the helicopter. Sure. Right. So, yeah. I mean, submarine is not that far of a stretch. No, I would I would have definitely thought this would appear in so, somewhere in his sketchbooks. And it's possible that there are other inventors who came before Bourne who proposed something similar. Bourne's is the earliest one that we have on record. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in 1625, you have Cornelius Drebbel, by the way. The names I came across while researching this, I love. Cornelius Drebbel is a great name. Not many people name their kids Cornelius No, anymore. but... Uh, oh, the, my, my wife does work with a Cornelius really? right, right now, though. That's yeah. a great name. Though. Strange. Cornelius is yeah. a great name. Also, uh, a fantastic character in the show Hello, Dolly. Must be a family name. Must be. Uh, this Cornelius was the court inventor for James I of England, hmm. which did not know that was a position. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I assume he invented stuff, not courts. That would have just been weird. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. Tennis courts, yeah, basketball exactly. courts. Yeah, exactly. Racquetball courts. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, uh, food courts. So <laughs> he created what many consider to be the first working submarine. And supposedly it traveled down and under the Thames River at a depth of 15 feet or so when it got to its deepest. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah, especially when you consider how it did this. It was propelled by 12 oarsmen. 
So the oars uh, extended out the side of this weatherproofed boat that also had a leather, you know, like a weather, uh, a waterproofed leather covering. Mm -hmm. The uh, the oars protruded through the covering, obviously, and then metal clamps were used to clamp the leather covering tight against the oars to maintain that watertight seal. Wow. Yeah. They Impressive. were uh, yeah. incredible yeah. for the time. Yeah. You know, and they used a design that's very similar to what a lot of uh, personal subs use in that the thing that allowed the boat to go under the water was its, its uh, hydrodynamic design. So the deck of this boat, the upper deck, sloped down toward the water's surface. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a ramp ah, in the front. Okay. The forward momentum of the oarsman would cause the boat's uh, uh, bow to go under the surface of the water. So the harder you row, the further down you would go. So you row faster, it dives deeper. And you have to keep that forward momentum because as soon as you stop, the buoyancy pushes the boat back up to the surface of the water. As you would want with the submarine. Yes. So, I mean, you get your, your oarsmen get tired. You might want to get up to the air pretty soon. Anyway. Yeah, I would think so. And, you know, you're, or you're pass out or whatever they do. Right? Yeah, yeah, which would happen, right? You yeah. breathe in enough carbon dioxide, you pass out. The boat comes up to the top. Hopefully someone's cognizant enough to open a hatch. Sure. And not, they can breathe again. No, I've seen early drawings of, of submarines and they're typically very, very cramped. They're not the, the monster ships that we think of now. Right. Very small. So it wouldn't take long to extinguish all the air that you have available to you. I mean, if you just look at World War II era submarines, and that that's late in the game for submarines, yeah. uh, you, you feel like, well, the, I'd be comfortable moving through this if I were about five foot four. Yeah. But any taller than that, and I've got to be real cognizant of where my head is. Yeah, there's other people in there. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not just the only person here. I need to, you know, yeah. six foot Bill is really taking up a lot of space. So uh, there are no illustrations or anything of this particular boat, but there were a lot of reports about it actually working. The people on the Thames were really impressed by it. James I was impressed by it. There's some uh, stories that say that he even took a ride on it, but most people dismiss that because James I was uh, known to be risk averse. Yeah. He was not someone who would put his body in direct peril. Well, I was thinking that maybe there were some people that advised him maybe not to try this. Probably. Yeah. Ben Johnson, the famous writer, actually referred to it as an invisible eel. That's what he called the boat. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of a cool design. Uh, moving on to 1634, that's when a French priest named Marin Mersenne worked out that a submarine should probably may be made out of some pretty strong stuff to withstand water pressure which we're going to learn later, was very important that some people did not pick up on. That's a horrible, terrible spoiler. So they're, so they're talking about going deeper than 15 feet, obviously. Yeah. Okay. And he said that, you know, if you wanted to actually have a submarine that could go to sufficient depths, you probably want to make it out of something like copper. Use, a, you know, a nice strong frame and coat it with copper. Mm, copper, and he, not the strongest metal. No, but stronger than wood. <laughs> That's true. He also thought that both ends should taper to a point. And the reason for that was that you could then reverse just as easily as you could go forward. And otherwise, if you have one end that comes to a point and the other end doesn't, you have to make a really wide turn to go back the way you came. Also makes it a little harder for the whale to swallow you. Yes. Uh, anything that makes it, uh, you know, whale swallowing that whole thing more difficult, <laughs> definitely sailors are in favor of that. I would put barbs on the outside. You know, don't don't use the easy to swallow gel covering yeah. on your copper submarine. Yeah, and don't uh, try try not to look like a, a fish in distress while you're out there. Also, also words to live by. Uh, there was a guy named uh, that we only know as Desson, D E S O N, a Frenchman uh, in 1654 who designed what he claimed would be a nigh unstoppable warship that was semi submerged, so not a full submersible the way we consider submarines. It was essentially a floating battering ram. And it was designed to sink enemy ships. So the battering ram itself was under the surface of the water. Only a little bit of the boat would protrude so that, you know, enemy ships wouldn't necessarily notice you when yeah. you're coming up on them. Very difficult to detect, especially at night, probably. Yes. Yeah. Uh, his design was 72 feet long. It is called the Rotterdam boat because he built it in Rotterdam. And he claimed that the clockwork propulsion system that he had installed in it would allow him to go from Rotterdam 
to London and back within the span of a day, which is remarkable in 1654. Mm. Only problem is he miscalculated how much work it would take to move a boat through the water, and it didn't move him at all. Mm. The clockwork failed, and so the boat was never used. Oh. But we could have had underwater battering rams as early as the mid-17th century yeah. had it not been for that. Yeah, well, he tried. Yeah, he did try. Another Frenchman named uh, Denis Papin, a mathematician, in 1690 said, hey, what if we use an air pump in order to change the buoyancy of a ship? He was actually thinking of, along lines of, let's not try and take on water. Let's change the air pressure inside the ship. Uh, there are no records of any of his designs, but the story says that he built a working submarine and was starting to build a second one when funding fell through and he scrapped the project, which I think a lot of people can identify with because mm -hmm. that happens all the time in all yeah. sorts of technologies. Yes, it does. Yeah. Never that, gets past prototype no. stage a lot of times. Yeah. And a lot of these prototypes end up being things where people say, that's a great idea. Thank you for the idea. Never doing anything with it. <laughs> or they uh, they adapt it to their own needs and or, or change it in some way that right. they can then take advantage of that yeah. person, unfortunately. Be like, hey, that's a great idea. I'm changing two things about it. Now it's my idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Trademark. Yeah. <laughs> TM, you didn't think about it, buddy. Uh, 1729, and I'm skipping over, by the way, there are tons of examples of different early submarines, many of which did not end well. In 1729, there was a guy named Nathaniel Simmons, or Simons, S-Y-M-O-N-S. He was a carpenter in England. He built a submarine that consisted of two wooden sections, a front and a back, joined in the middle by a panel of pleated leather. So think of like an accordion or a concertina, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So it can it can scrunch in and get make the whole ship shorter, or it can extend and make the whole ship longer. Mm -hmm. And this is how he would either sink it or float it based upon the amount of displacement that he was creating. Uh, it had no means of propulsion, however. So it could go down into the water, yeah. and it could come back up from the bottom of the river that he was using it in. What his plan was, was to make such a spectacle that people would be overcome with amazement that a man could go down to the bottom of a river and live there for more than an hour and then come back up, none the worse for wear, and then they'd throw money at him. Oh, so this is like a water elevator. Yeah, except it didn't go anywhere. It was more like, like, think of like a magician, a busker, who's trying to, or like just someone just playing a song, just trying to hope for tips. Mm -hmm. you know, they got their little guitar case out there. Except sure. in this case, he's got an enormous boat that <laughs> sinks into a river and occasionally comes back up again. Yeah. Uh, people did not leave a lot of tips in his tip jar. Yeah, they probably left when he submerged himself thinking, well, that guy's gone. Yeah, the see you later, loser. Uh, <laughs> turns out it did not pay for itself. So it ended up being just a curiosity. And of course, like I said, there was no propulsion system. It, there was no practical application for it. What a strange bit of history, huh? <laughs> yes, I thought so too. I should make a note of that for Ridiculous History. <laughs> By the way, if you aren't subscribed to Ridiculous History, you should totally subscribe to Ridiculous History. It's a fun show. Uh, 1774, John Day, an English shipbuilder, created a fairly small watertight chamber that was weighed down by stones. So again, not really a submarine. It's something that would allow you to sink to the bottom of a body of water. Uh, the chamber had these stones attached to it, like strung along the outside of it. And on the inside of the chamber were bolts that if you pulled the bolt, it would release a stone. So that was how you could release stones and allow yourself to pop back up to the surface. And the whole point of this was very similar to what Simons was trying to do. It was an idea of like, I can make money by convincing people, hey, like, uh, I'm going to do this crazy stunt. Pay me. Mm -hmm. So he goes out and he finds another guy named Christopher Blake. Christopher Blake was a bit of a gambler, a risk taker. And he said to Blake, here's my idea. We build a bigger one of these and we make a claim saying that I'm going to go down to the bottom of Plymouth Harbor and I'm going to stay there for 24 hours. Wow. And after 24 hours, I'm going to come back up. And if I can do it, we win the bet and uh, I just need you to back me because you have money. You can back my part of the bet. And Blake says, this is interesting. We'll, we'll see if anyone will take us up on the bet. And if we win, you get 10% of the winnings. Mm -hmm. And so day says, let's do it. So they did. They got lots and lots of people to bet on it. So tons of money going into this. The day comes and John day gets into his larger watertight container using the exact same premise now, before he had been practicing in a river, 
not in a harbor. Mm -hmm. You might see where this is going. Yeah. Rivers are not as deep as harbors are. Yeah. He had not tested this in uh, water that was as deep, which was 100 feet deep. And it's a wooden structure. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Yep. Turned out to be too much. Uh, the structure collapsed. Day did not survive. Yeah. Uh, he did not win his bet. Blake did not get to collect lots of money from people. And people who were perhaps a little more sensible made a little money that day in a very sad way. Yeah, no kidding. So he jumped in, into the harbor essentially with a bunch of rocks tied to him. Yep. And uh, that was it. Sunk to the sunk to about 100 feet. The pressure caused the structure to fail. And uh, yeah, it he he drowned. Awful. Yeah, not a not a good way to go. No, um, not a great uh, element of the submarine story, but one that I thought was really interesting because a century earlier, you had a French priest say, you know, if you want to go deep, you should probably use something sturdier than wood. So people had been talking about it for 100 years. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, you know, this guy wasn't really taking it to heart. And it turned out that that was uh, his fatal undoing. Mm. Now, 1776 is a great musical. It's also <laughs> an important year in American history. It's a little more than a musical. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, sit down, John. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's a very important year in American history. And uh, in fact, it features the first time that someone was attempting to use a submarine in actual wartime during the Revolutionary War here in what is now America, but at the time was a British colony. And colonist David Bushnell built the submarine. It's called the Turtle. You may have heard of this. It was kind of egg-shaped. Uh, it's the first submarine ever to actually attack an enemy ship. Not successfully, but we'll get into it. Deep in the back of your mind, you've always had the feeling that there's something strange about reality. Well, there is. Hi, I'm Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick. And we're the host of the science podcast, Stuff to Blow Your Mind. What's it like to be possessed by fungus? How did Neanderthals think? Here's what we stand for. Scientific skepticism, open-minded curiosity, and a love of the weird. Because the world is weird, weirder than we imagine it, and we'll never understand it unless we're willing to go down, down to that place where our intuitions fail. Could you create a god inside a computer? Does the present moment actually exist? On Stuff to Blow Your Mind, we put science on a collision course with philosophy, history, religion, mythology, and the worst space werewolf movies of all time. We examine neurological quandaries, cosmic mysteries, evolutionary marvels, and our transhuman future, all in order to decipher the nature of our reality and expand the mind. Subscribe to the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more at StuffToBlowYourMind.com. Bushnell uh, supposedly uh, talked with a, another luminary of the time, a certain Benjamin Franklin, uh, a smarty pants, mm -hmm. who kind of advised him on his plan. And they built this egg-shaped submarine that had two propellers, so sort of screw-shaped propellers, uh, one facing directly in front of the person. So rotating a, a hand crank one direction would cause you it to pull the submarine along. So okay. you would go forward. The second propeller was in a vertical alignment. So mm -hmm. it allow you to sink lower or surface again. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole purpose of this was to allow someone to very secretly and sneakily get up to enemy ships, so British Navy ships, surface, drill a hole into the enemy ship, attach a mine that has a clockwork mechanism to allow it to detonate, mm -hmm. and then get the heck out of Dodge mm -hmm. before things go kablooey. Well, it's a simple plan. Simple plan. Yeah, what, what could, could go wrong? What could possibly happen in that time frame? It uh, would, would cause some kind of disaster at yeah. sea, right? Now, now fortunately... Spoiler alert for people who, who get really anxious about this kind of stuff. No disaster occurred, but it was unsuccessful. So it was unsuccessful, but not tragic for Bushnell or, to that matter, for Ezra Lee, who was the, uh, the sergeant who actually piloted the turtle. Mm -hmm. uh, Bushnell said, here's the thing. I built the darn thing. I'm not strong enough 
or skilled enough to actually pilot it. Mm-hmm. Like there's a foot pedal that would allow you to control the bladders that would that would bring on water or remove water. There were the two hand cranks for navigation. Uh, it was very hot. Work sure, sure, it's extremely physical. Yeah, uh, you know, to to propel this thing through the water. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and this was yeah. not hydrodynamically designed, really. <laughs> and no. so Ezra Lee did it. He managed to get up to a British ship called the Eagle, but he was unable to penetrate the Eagle's hull with a drill. And there's some conjecture about why this is. Some people think that perhaps he was even suffering from carbon dioxide poisoning. That he had been. Uh, breathing so heavily and breathing his own air for so long mm-hmm. that 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 made it that exacerbated things, it made him weaker than he otherwise would have been. Sure, and I think that's the case in all of these we talked about so far. When you're under the surface, you're you're physically powering the ship, and yeah. you're you're uh, you're exercising, you're breathing more than you would at rest. Sure. So that becomes a factor in all of these, and I, I doubt that many people earlier than this had even considered that possibility. Right, and you know, some of the earlier submarines had things like air tubes that would extend up above the surface, but obviously if you want something that's going to be sneaky, you can't do that. You know how hard it would be to breathe through a snorkel that it would be uh, let's say even even ten feet long. Yeah, be very difficult. So yeah. I don't. I, I doubt the effectiveness of that. Of that sure. snorkel that's fifteen feet long for a crew of men. Right. Yeah. And so yeah, until you get to the point where you have things like carbon dioxide scrubbers, which is much 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 later. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's 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 a you can just imagine it being a miserable experience to oh. be inside one of these things. Sure. So they think he may have uh, when he exited the ship, he might have been uh, a little bit delirious. Sure. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now. He realized that he wasn't going to be able to complete his mission, so the best thing he could do is try and escape. So he gets back into the turtle and starts to move away, and the British see that there's something flowing in the water, and like, what the heck is that? Let's send some rowboats out there to check it out. So some uh, British sailors get into rowboats, and, you know, they've got guns and stuff. Yeah, Turtle's not really going to be able to withstand too much punishment, so what Lee does is he's pretty smart. He He lets loose the mine so that it's a distraction. It it doesn't blow up, but it does create another thing for everyone to go check out while he continues to try and skedaddle. Mm-hmm. He manages to get a safe distance away and escapes. He he does not, you know, the turtle does not collapse. Oh, smart. He manages to get away. It does not ma- mark a successful attempt mm-hmm. to attack an enemy ship, but it is the first time in recorded history where we have someone using a submarine to try to attack an enemy So as ship. close as they've been to date. Yes. Now, in the 1790s, a guy comes up with his own idea for submarines and thinks that it would be a great weapon in war. This guy would later on become incredibly famous for a, a related technology, and that guy is Robert Fulton. And if the name sounds familiar, it's because you probably are like a fan of things like like Mark Twain, because Fulton was the guy who made the steamship really famous. Mm-hmm. So late 1700s, you know, it's almost the almost the turn of the century. He comes up with this idea for submarines, and he at the time not real crazy about the British Navy, not a big fan. He goes over to France, uh, meets a meets a guy named Boney, Nappy Boney, Napoleon Bonaparte. Is, <laughs> okay, uh, right. Nappy Boney to his friends. <laughs> That's funny. So Nappy Boney, uh, he says to him, uh, "Hey, buddy, uh, short stuff. Just kidding. It really wasn't." <laughs> but he says, "Hey, buddy, uh, I got this idea. This if you if you make this this underwater boat, not only will you be incredibly effective against enemy ships, but ultimately you'll be so effective." that no one will ever dare use their Navy against you because you'll just decimate that Navy. In fact, we'll eventually get to a point, and I can't believe that Robert Fulton was arguing this, but it's so funny that history repeats itself. We'll get to a point where everyone will build these underwater ships, and then no one will ever declare war on anyone else because if you were, you would be raining down destruction on yourself. He was arguing about mutually assured destruction Mm -hmm. via submarine battles. Crazy. Yeah, and then flash forward a couple hundred years and you've got the whole basis of the Cold War, right? Well, he's Uh, really talking up the submarine capabilities here, huh? Well, and he really believed it. I mean, he was 100% sure that he could do this. And in fact, he created some pretty innovative features uh, in his design. He created some fins, some stabilization fins that also would allow for controlled diving so that you'd be able to steer while diving, which was brand new Mm -hmm. before it either would start sinking or would start surfacing. And that was it. 
but his design got a little more sophisticated than that. So are, are we talking like uh, nuclear warheads? You know, like like nuclear tipped ballistic missiles and things like that. No, we're talking still like clockwork mines. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit. In the yeah, timeline. still a little. He did have a, he did add a periscope. He's the first guy to add a periscope to a submarine. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now periscopes had been around for a while, but they had been used on land. Mm-hmm. They had not been used on on submersibles. So if you happen to let's say want to attend the town parade, but perhaps you are on the shorter side. You could get a periscope and see over the crowd, right? It's just a series of mirrors and lenses is all it is. Perfect use of one. Yeah. And so he came up with the idea of actually incorporating that in the design of submarines so that you could peek up above the surface of the water without completely coming up, right? Yeah, sure. Giving it away. Yeah. So it's, I mean, the whole point of this was to try and create a secret stealth vehicle. Uh, he gave his prototype... He actually built one of these, and he gave his prototype an awesome name that would be used for other submarines, the Nautilus. Oh, yeah. A great name for a submarine. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the French looked at it, and they said, here's the problem, because at this point, it's still man-powered. It's too slow. It's too cumbersome. It's not a good vehicle for war, Mm -hmm. because by the time... We actually deploy one and get toward a ship. You're moving so slowly that if you are detected, there's really nothing else you can. You can't really take evasive maneuvers. You're not going to be able to outrun anybody. Um, it it to us is too much expense, not enough reward for that expense. So Fulton's heartbroken. He's tried to push this on the French because of his hatred of the British Navy. So then he does the only thing any smart businessman does. He goes to England. And he says to the English government, hey, you know, the French were thinking about this submersible thing, but I've got the idea. I got the plans right here, buddy. Yeah, I can give it to you today for half price. True capitalist right there, right? So he comes <laughs> up to them and um, uh, Prime Minister William Pitt looks at it and says, this is really interesting, but I would much prefer to hire you to create uh, what were called torpedoes. But they were not the kind of torpedoes we think of today. They were still essentially clockwork mines. His idea was to create a raft that would have a mine mounted on the underside of the raft. You would have a sailor paddle a raft that has a lower profile than most boats out to a ship, attach the mine to an enemy ship, paddle away, and then eventually the timer would go off and the mine would explode. Uh, And that he got paid for, but no one wanted the Nautilus. Eventually it would get junked, and then he would come back to the United States and get into steamships in a big way. So his story ended... uh, Def, you know, he didn't end in defeat. He did plenty well for himself in a totally, uh, in a semi-related field. We talk about steamboats, like paddle boat steamboats. Yeah. 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 On Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's uh, that's Fulton. Yeah. You know what? There's still there's still examples of those around. People still oh, yeah. jump on those for uh, you know riverboat cruises down the uh, down the Mississippi and things like that. It's it's a fun time. People tried using steam engines to power submarines. Can you imagine a couple uh, of problems with that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine uh, lots of problems with it, yes. So, uh, one is that you have to have fire. Yes, that's problem uh, number which one. Would, which would take up quite a bit of oxygen, and oxygen is at a premium Yes, uh, when you're underwater. As it turns out, that was the, the biggest issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, heat, also another one. But ox- oxygen being very important, that was, that was one. Another big problem, actually, is that steamships use boilers, right? You've got a, a, a container filled with water. Yeah. Right. So it turns out you've got a container of water inside a vessel that itself is in a body of water. Yeah. Whenever that vessel would change in attitude, right, starting to point down or point up or left or right, the water sloshes around. This causes more internal momentum, which changes the motion of the overall vessel, which meant that for those particular early submarines, when you were diving, you were diving at a real steep descent. And same thing when you were coming up, you were ascending at a very steep angle. Mm-hmm. So imagine those old episodes of Star Trek where the entire crew is being, is is like throwing themselves left and right on the bridge. Oh yeah. Except that's really happening. You're oh. going forward and backward every single time. Oh my gosh. So there's no, there's no uh, walk in between um, and parts of the vessel when it's ascending or descending. It's more like rolling between at that point. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're just you're, hanging on and hoping that you, yeah. uh, you don't fall to the bottom. If you're lucky, maybe maybe you're strapped into something yeah. if you're really fortunate. But yeah. yes, it was a real problem. And that was a problem for submarines really leading all the way up to the electrical age. Hmm. Uh, there are well, a couple of other really cool historical ones. Well, that and well, one last thing on the, uh, yeah. the steam-powered ones. Absolutely. Was, uh, boilers had a propensity to explode sometimes. Yep. 
That was also an yeah, issue. They weren't well put together. Uh, they were also sometimes converted into submarines. Mm. One of the ones during the Civil War was. Uh, mm. There were actually a few submarines that were built and submersibles, semi-submersibles that were built during the Civil War here in the United States. Uh, the Union had one called the Alligator, which was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It was a human-powered submarine used by the Union forces. Uh, it had a sealable hatchway that allowed a diver to leave the boat while it was underwater for the purposes of attaching a mine to an enemy ship. Now, that's a cool idea. Yeah, and it was the first time anyone had managed to make one of those. By the way, alligator is a great name for one of those because it looks like an alligator on the surface. It does. Yeah. Uh, and that particular design was, just looking at it, it's pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this idea of having essentially like an airlock-style a diver's lock uh, was really innovative and allowed them to do stuff that other ships could not do. They'd have to surface in order for someone to get out, mm -hmm. right? They couldn't just let them out in the underwater. But on the Confederate side of the war, you had one of these boilers that got converted into a submarine. Uh, that was done by a guy named H.L. Hunley. And the Confederates were really determined to use this submarine. You can tell because on the first two test runs, not actual deployments of the Hunley, but the first two test runs, it sank both times. The first time it killed five crew members. The second time it killed everyone aboard, including Hunley himself. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So all the crew perished. They still used it. Uh, the Confederates deployed it, um, and it even was used to uh, sink a ship. It actually sank the USS Housatonic in a successful attack, but the Hunley also sank. Hmm. Uh, some people think that maybe it suffered damage because it, its weapon was essentially a long spear tipped with an explosive. Oh, my gosh. So you had to actually ram into the side of the enemy ship. Wow. So uh, the inventor then didn't get to see the success of his own invention. Right. Really. He had already drowned in a trial. Oh, my gosh. And then as the Hunley was sailing away from the Housatonic, uh, it sank either because it suffered damage from that explosion, or uh, there's also the possibility that a nearby ship that was rushing to the aid of the Union vessel that was struck, uh, the wake that it was creating was enough to slosh over an open hatch mm. on the Hunley and thus flood it. Oh, you know what? I, I Just hearing this story, it seems like the explosive on a stick yeah. Might be the might be the problem. Probably I mean, how, probably problem number one. How definitely. close are you yeah. going to get? I mean, you don't have a whole lot of control. You know, the longer that stick gets, really. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm assuming that it was a fairly short stick, and probably they did uh, you know sustain some damage. I'm sure. Yeah. And, I mean, and like I said, it was the fact that they had already lost a crew plus five crew or all but five crew members. Well, two uh, in two, trials. Yeah, well, we're talking like two, essentially two full crews, really. Yeah. Oh. Man. Yeah, and That's... yet they were determined to try and get this to work. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Uh, the first, in, none of those, by the way, were mechanical. Those were all human-powered submarines. Mm -hmm. The first mechanical submarine didn't launch until 1863 in France. Wow. Called Le Plongeur. <laughs> very clever. Because it takes the plunge. Yeah, very clever. Yeah, and it used compressed air. It also had that same problem I was talking about with the stability issues with uh, with the steam-powered ones mm -hmm. in that it would do those very steep dives and ascensions back up to the surface mm -hmm. to the point where no one thought of it as practical. It was just too it was too unwieldy, too uncontrollable whenever you wanted to dive or, or uh, surface. Oh, man, that's something I don't want to hear when I get into a submarine is uh, it's, it's uncontrollable. Yeah, not... Not the best adjective. Yeah, it doesn't uh, doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence. Yeah. as they're sealing that hatch. That's like that's like hearing it's almost watertight. <laughs> no, I'm, and and you I know what? Most to... of them were almost watertight. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. So we're getting up to the end of my my history lesson here. Uh, in the 1880s, that's when the battery technology was starting to get to the point where you were beginning to see people put in electric motors and experiment with that for submarines, which turned out to be. Fantastic, because sure. you no longer needed manpower to move the parts. You didn't have to worry about steam. You didn't have to worry about a fire. You didn't yeah. have to worry about that sloshing that was creating stability issues. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the technology for submarines began to take off and people began to refine things like the design of the submarine, the various instrumentation you would need on a submarine to be able to navigate effectively underwater, particularly once you start getting to depths where you could no longer have any sort of uh, transparent window. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, you, you're, you're sailing by instrumentation alone. Yeah. So clearly you have to have 
extremely precise maps and extremely precise instruments. And, and we're talking about 1860. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly as precise as it is today. No, no. It wouldn't be until after like World War II era that we started getting really, really accurate underwater maps. Is that terrifying? After yeah. World War II. Oh, yeah. And, and you know how extensively they were used in you know World War II. Oh, so, sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah ter- I mean, the, the U-boats, I mean, that was the Germany was infamous for their U-boats. Sure. Like they were. They they were oh, they really were, inspired terror on the seas. Oh, they were feared by all. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah, and so you know, but it was not. A, it still wasn't an era where you really knew everything that you were going to encounter. And of course, you can't see anything down there. So you're you're relying completely upon the records that have been generated over time, and you know, t- keeping an eye on a watch to make sure you know. Okay, well, in five seconds, we need to have a 20 degree turn to port. Oh my gosh. Like think think of what a what a map of the ocean floor might look like in 1860. Yeah. I, I mean, you're going by that. Here there be squid. Yeah. Essentially. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So that gives us our our background. And now it's finally time for us to talk about personal submarines. We're going to skip ahead over all the different you know, the, the different evolutions of the battery powered and the diesel powered and the nuclear powered submarines. We're going to go straight to pleasure craft, essentially, is what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. And in my research, I essentially came to the conclusion that that these personal submarines are meant for one of three potential markets. OK, what's that? Uh, market number one is for perhaps uh, organizations dedicated to studying the ocean and they have amassed enough money to get some of these smaller submarines to allow for more maneuverability to study specific biomes under the sea. Okay. Uh, But a lot of them tend to be a little more uh, luxury based than what you would typically think of for a research institute. Sure. Yeah. Number two, tourism. So Tour companies, like you might go around on a cruise and you see on the excursions, take a submarine ride on such and such. I can see that happening, too, especially for some of the higher end ones where you, you're you going to a company that has invested money into buying one of these and then they make it back by selling admission to sure. take rides on At it. a vacation location, which is uh, going to have crystal clear waters and, yeah. and lots of wildlife. That kind of thing. And you're going to like St. Thomas or something sure. and you want to be able to see the ocean. Mm-hmm. Third is Filthy, stinking rich billionaires. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who just want the adventure. It's all I, about adventure. Yeah. I have a feeling that's – and if you're looking at the marketing for most of these, that seems to be who they're targeting, which you imagine has got to be a, a fairly small market. Uh, but it's a market. And you know what? They sell plenty of cars that are these uh, ultra-high luxury, you know, uh, ex- extremely um, expensive toys yes. for, for the, the very wealthy. And, and they sell a lot of them. Every year. Yes. So there's a, there is a market out there. Yeah. It, it amazes me that, well, it's because, again, we're not in that tax bracket. And so it's hard for me to imagine a life where I could, uh, I one, where I could even afford one. And yeah. two, where not only could I afford one, but I could buy it and still, you know, eat. Um, <laughs> because it, right now we're talking about vehicles that if I were to save up over the course of, 20 years, I might be able to buy one, but that's if I didn't spend money on anything else, yeah. right? It's so saving every single penny you make and yeah. uh, and nothing else. Right, yeah, right. Gotcha. Like just I've become an air terrian. I'm just a breatharian. That's when I'm just <laughs> breathing air and taking in all my nutrients, which yeah. doesn't work, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's very, very expensive to get into this game, isn't it? Yeah, and I was looking around. I came across an uh, organization called P-Subs, psubs.org, uh, and they actually have – some interesting information. First of all, uh, here is a definition for personal submarines that I pulled from a site. Personal submarines are those submarines which are owned by some person as a personal property and not owned by a government or any public organization. They're usually used for recreational underwater experience, exploration, or sometimes for scientific research. They are usually small in size and sometimes are called mini submarines. Their capacity ranges from one person to 25 or more persons. Wow. At that point, I don't think I can call it really small. Uh, usually, five to nine seater submarines are used for research purpose, and submarines with higher capacity are used for tourism purposes. In 1996, the Personal Submersibles Organization, or PSUBS, was founded. Now, this started as a group of enthusiasts 
who were talking about boats on a list server, the old list servers of the real pre-web days or early web days. So they would go to a list server called uh, rec.boats.building, R-E-C, rec, like recreation. Sure. So this people who build boats for fun, Mm -hmm. you know, things that they're building pleasure craft. Yeah. Well, there were about four or five people on that list who wanted to talk about the possibility of a personal submarine. But that really didn't fit with the overall conversation that was going on in the group. So they took it offline. Well, they they kept it online, but they took it off the list and they just started chatting through email. They just kind of had a group email going where they were talking about their interests. Eventually, they decided to create... Uh, their own list server. In 1997, they created an archive of it. And by October 1997, they secured the the domain psubs.org. And uh, as it stands, if you go to that today, psubs.org, you can find tons of information about personal submarines uh, and their deep discussions about things. And they have very important points to make about things like uh, safety and reliability and and how useful is it? How user-friendly are some of these? Mm-hmm. Because as you can imagine, Scott, piloting one of these things underwater is not necessarily the most intuitive thing, especially when you get into more complicated environments, like you're talking about reefs and things of that nature. Sure. And um, uh, I'm sure you could imagine that these are not, Vehicles that necessarily would say stop on a dime. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not as intuitive as it would be to drive a car or something. Yeah, in, in that same, uh, you're not, you're not driving up to the edge of a cliff and stopping. Right. Uh, you, you're also having to deal with uh, with uh, with currents. Sure. With uh, rough Tides. seas above. Yeah, yep. exactly right. And uh, and just a host of other things that you're not even thinking about. Not uh, you know up down motion versus just uh, you know left right back forward. Uh, you've also got, you know, another access to, con- you know, to be concerned with. Sure. And and not all of these, not all of them that we're going to talk about have those really, really simple controls, but they're getting there. Some, right. of the, some of the newer ones are very user friendly and their goal is to make them easy enough for anybody to drive. Yeah. To make it so intuitive that uh, just with a, a simple training session, you can get to a point where you're comfortable enough piloting around uh, an, an open ocean environment, for example, or a lake environment in some cases. Yeah. But it hasn't always been that way. No, no. And, and you know, it, it took a lot of work from a lot of people to get up to that point. Um, I'm sure when you were looking through all this, you came across the name Graham Hawks. Yes. Hi, this is John Roderick from the rock band The Long Winters. And I'm Ken Jennings. I'm a writer and former Jeopardy genius. Why why do you get to be two things and I'm only one thing? Because I'm twice as accomplished as you. I left things out, John. That's that's so not true. Uh, We have a podcast now called Omnibus. Omnibus is going to be launching on December 7th. Uh, Well, that was a day that formerly lived in infamy and now is a day of rejoicing. We are taking it back. Uh, new episodes will follow thereafter on non-infamous days every Tuesday and Thursday. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's at the grocery store or know, you see them laying on the side of the street. We're not going to judge. They hang over telephone wires like shoes. Just make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. That's right. Subscribe. Listen to me now so you never miss an episode. So Graham Hawks, uh, he is a marine engineer. Mm-hmm. He was born in London, 1947. And uh, he was famous for lots of stuff. I mean, he's built pretty much in the 1980s, 1990s. All of the small submersibles were based off of his designs. Mm-hmm. And he set a world record in 2007 for the deepest solo dive. That was when he went down 910 meters or around almost 3,000 feet. Um in a solo submarine. And he held that record for a long time until a certain Hollywood director smashed it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh. But he was in the deep Rover. And, uh, as it turns out, like a lot of the personal submarines that are out there now yeah. are, are still, they're, they're his designs. Like yeah. if you see any of the deep flight stuff, most of the deep flight stuff comes directly from his design. Yeah. That's what I'm familiar uh, with him in uh, is in the deep flight in particular in the, uh, is it, what's it called? The dragon, I think yeah. is the one. It's a two person uh, submersible. It looks yeah. an awful lot like a, as he describes it, like a formula one car. Yeah, it does. That goes underwater. Yeah. Very cool. And he describes it as uh, as almost like a, a, a quadcopter 
that you're flying underwater, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, it's got two vertically aligned rotors that are on either side of the the chassis where you would be sitting. Mm -hmm. And those allow you to have that hovering ability at a certain depth, right? Like you can actually set how deep you want to go up to a, up to the the vehicle's limit. You, mm -hmm. know, like you don't have unlimited uh, diving. It can only go uh, so far. It goes down to about 120 meters, just shy of 400 feet. You know what's funny is uh, as we're talking about this now, and you just mentioned that somebody had shattered his record. I I, I hadn't been familiar with his record up in, up until this point. Yeah. Uh, but something that he said in one of the videos that I watched uh, in preparation for today it's, it's telling, I guess. He said, you know, it used to be all about we wanted to go deeper, deeper, deeper. That was one of the things he said. You know, yeah. like it, it, that was the the point ahead of time. But he said, now, now we've, we've kind of shifted to, to a different mindset. It's now that we want to uh, make the ocean more accessible to everybody. We mm -hmm. want it to be um, something that is a little more inclusive, that, you know, anybody can spend just a few bucks to rent a sub and go out and enjoy what we've been enjoying all along. Uh, but it has cost us millions of dollars. You can you can now just spend a few dollars and go out and you know kind of get that experience, even if it's for one day. Yeah. Uh, but but we're not talking about as you just mentioned, and I, I'm getting us a little bit off track. I'm sorry, but the no, depth thing this. the depth thing really got to me. But you were saying that you know most of them are kind of limited to uh, just ballpark. We'll, we'll guess it's like 300, 400 feet. Yeah. That's that's the majority of the personal subs that I looked up. Is is that sure. the maximum depth? Yep. Yep. If you if you're looking at like the super expensive ones, the ones that are a couple million dollars, uh, some of the ones that uh, U.S. submarines uh, slash Titan do or Triton, I'm sorry, Triton do are uh, are rated to go much deeper. But those are the ones that are incredibly expensive. Did you ever see The Abyss, the movie The Abyss? Yes. You know, those those sort of orb shaped submersibles they use. Almost all of the Triton ones look like that. Yeah. And there are several of those that are rated to go uh, really, really deep. Um, but they, you know, they they don't look, they're not sexy like the deep flight ones. The deep flight ones, you look at that and you're like, oh, that looks like, it looks like a sports vehicle. Well, there's a good reason for all this too. And that's mm -hmm. because the, the, the people that are going to be buying something like this, I mean, it's all about seeing what's down there, right? Yes. And when you get to a certain depth in any body of water, there's going to be a point where sunlight doesn't penetrate anymore. It's it's black. Right. Uh, so if uh, let, let's say, for instance, uh, you know, the, the one video that I watched from uh, Deep Flight was shot in Lake Tahoe. And mm. Lake Tahoe, very crystal clear blue water, right? But about 400 feet down, uh, it's pointless to go any deeper than that in a submarine that's meant just for observation. If you're yeah. going down to, you know, take samples, that's something different. You know, you don't need to be able to see in order, in order to do that. You have external lights and you can you can check out what's there. But if you're going down there just simply for the beauty of the lake and to really experience it and to, you know, get the wow factor, I guess, it's pointless to go below about 400 feet in that lake with a, a passenger who's just more of a sightseer. Right. And and that's what this type of craft is really for. So, you know, they, they've built it. That's it. That's a test depth, I guess, is that yeah. the, the depth. Uh, there's, you know, can I mention something right now? Too, sure. While we're talking about this. There are three types of depth. It will come up when you talk about submersibles. Mm -hmm. And the first one is test depth, or if you're reading about them, you'll, you'll come across these. Test depth is the maximum depth that, uh, that a sub can go in normal operation. That's mm -hmm. what the, you know, they're saying, like, probably shouldn't take it below about 330 feet. You want to stay above that, of course. Right. Uh, there's design depth, and design depth is a little bit different, but that's the depth that uh, design engineers think that the sub can go and still be able to return to the surface safely, you know, without any mm -hmm. kind of crushing, without any collapse of any of the structure of the, of the sub because of the pressure. Uh, and then there is crush depth. Now, crush depth is something that you want to stay away from, of course. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the depth that happens, uh, th that a lot of subs achieve when they, uh, they're out of control and they just simply drop to the bottom. Now, there's, right. a, there's a crush depth, and what happens is that there's a, a rupture or a tear in the body, it's it's crushed by the pressure, the immense pressure on the outside. It just it collapses it like a can. Yeah. And uh, what happens is that the pressure from the outside it becomes instantly the same pressure on the inside and just rips everything apart. So, yeah. Uh, it's that like, is a, it looks like an implosion. Yeah. So if you hear of a sub that has dropped to the bottom of the ocean, there's a good chance that it has achieved crush depth. And if it has, there's there's really no saving that crew or sub or, you know, any of that. Right. But – there's a chance, there's a chance, there's a slight chance that you can come back from crush depth. You can get to a point where a sub will uh, have exterior damage, uh, you know, that it does begin to collapse. And if it's recovered quickly enough, they can they can make it back to the surface. So you can get to what they do call crush depth and then and still make it. But it's, uh, 
Well, actually, they say that, you know, it's it's probably more common than you might think because they realize something's wrong. You know, they, we spring a leak. There's uh, there's some collapsing going on. You, you um, hear you hear groaning in the submarine that is beyond what you normally hear. Yeah. You know, I heard a, a tale and this is just something I've read somewhere. And I don't have a, a, you know, a source for this because I, I just didn't write it down. But mm. uh, a couple of sailors that were in uh, a submarine said that they would tie, you know, the the uh, the ribs, I guess, that go around the outside of a sure. sub. And this is an older primitive sub. I think they were a, a marine sub. Uh, sorry, not a marine sub, a uh, a naval sub. Yep, yep. And they tie. They, what they would do is they tie a string between the walls, I guess, of the sub, if you want to call it that, the rounded walls of the uh-huh. sub, uh, on a couple of these uh, these these um, just hooks that they had up there, and they would tie it tight. And as the sub would descend, it would it would it slack. would get slack it because get slack. the interior is being pushed in. Exactly right. So they knew if they were going deeper and deeper, there would be more and more slack in that line. And as they went, as it started to rise to the surface, they, it would become tight again. That's where, that gets to a point where you're saying, uh, Captain, we might need to, you know, maybe just just let's just go up a couple feet. Shall well, we? Yeah, what you might not want to do though is uh, is is secure something like that. Like let's say if it was uh, it was um, uh, it was a wire a wire instead of a rope. Yeah, you know, something that uh, doesn't have any give. You definitely don't want to attach that while you're at depth. Because sure. as you ascend, it just tears at the wall. It's going to rip the walls yeah. apart. Yeah. So I thought that was a clever way, you know, for for them. Just kind of wherever in the sub to kind of uh, have a semi-accurate measure of how deep they are. Yeah, I like that idea. Uh, Fortunately, with the pleasure subs we're talking about, that would not really be a factor for most of them. Because most of them, again, are like one or two person ones for the for the real pleasure subs. There's some that are like five or seven people, but that then it's like. A pilot sitting in the front and then a group of people sitting kind of behind or to the side of the pilot who yeah. can kind of look through like an observation window. Like an underwater bus. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. a big bubble front. And, you know, that's the thing is that all of these that we found, uh, it, you know, sightseeing, I guess, or being able to see everything around you mm-hmm. is is key to this. It's not it's not like a military sub where, you know, again, it's instruments and you're down in the depths where it's right. so dark. This is all about being able to uh, you know, connect with the water, the, you know, the the. Um, the aqua li- the aquatic life, I guess it's a yeah, right. yeah. struggling for words. Sorry. It's, a, yeah, it's all about being able to see, uh, you know, animals like like dolphins and whales and all the, uh, varieties of fish. Uh, so you definitely want nice, large, viewable like ports that you can look out of. Sure. Uh, you want and you want a a vehicle that you can operate by sight, like you can you can navigate by sight. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would still have instrumentation to keep you aware of where your relative position is uh, compared to say, let's be honest, your super yacht, because chances are that's how you got out to wherever you are anyway. <laughs> so you got to be able, you know, you need to know where your super yacht is. The, most of these have uh, operating uh, like useful operating hours that range between like four and eight hours, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Some of them are less than that. Uh, so obviously you don't want to go too far away because if you do, then that's going to be a lot of rowing for you to get back to your yeah. super yacht. Almost all are electric operation as well. Yep. Yep. They yep. all, all the ones I came across were lithium ba- battery powered. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them uh, have a, a specific type of uh, of buoyancy. It's fixed positive buoyancy is what's mm-hmm. called. Very that, smart. Yes. That means that when everything is turned off, it is naturally buoyant. So it'll it'll float to the top. So, for example, the dragon one you were mentioning earlier, yeah, it has those two rotors that are like almost like a drone rotors, right? That that are vertically aligned. Well, those are what allow you to stay under the water, along with forward momentum. It's got some of that same design that I mentioned from centuries ago, mm-hmm. where moving forward helps drive the nose of your vehicle down a little bit, so it keeps you submerged. But the two Rotors definitely maintain that and allow you to have a nice level attitude while you're going down there. Uh, the, all that turns off, then it's just going to rise up to the top of the the water because it's positively buoyant. Yeah, and control of that is very simple. I mean, I, I said they're trying to make it as easy as possible for everybody now to mm-hmm. use these. And uh, you know, the the left hand, I believe, operates the up down attitude of the of the you know, of the ship. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the other hand, your right hand, would operate a joystick, which would allow you uh, a little further movement, left, right, you know, forward, backward, that type of thing. Uh, so it's very, very simple. And these these uh, particular ones we're talking about, like the Dragon, are designed kind of like a, a fighter jet where you've got the the pilot and passenger, it's front and back type of uh, seating arrangement. Oh, You're not yeah. Not se- seated side by side. Yeah. Uh, which I actually kind of think is kind of cool. Uh, that's a real uh, cool design. Yeah. They also have one called the Super Falcon, which is it looks more like a jet 
than the um, the dragon. The dragon looks kind of like a, a car, and the Super mm-hmm. Falcon looks kind of like a jet. Oh, it's a little more needle shaped. Um, it's it's almost twenty feet long. So they still say it's one of the smaller personal submersibles that can fit on your typical super yacht. And <laughs> and I'm thinking all of these words don't make sense to me. Smaller personal submarine and typical super yacht. All of that is like so antithetical to my experience that I'm having difficulty imagining it. Uh, by the way, if you're a listener of Tech Stuff and you have a super yacht and you would like to show me what a super yacht's all about, I'll take you up on it. Um. Because I've never been on one. I've been on cruise ships. That's as close as I've managed to get. <laughs> but not personally owned cruise ships. No, uh, yeah, yeah. I know. The, the, the cruise ships I was on were owned by enormous corporations, <laughs> uh, including one that, uh, that has a couple of really popular theme parks around the world. Um, but yeah, these are these are your basic kind of personal submarine craft. They use electric motors. Uh, they use electric propellers. Um Oh, and you're showing me some more of the designs over here. Well, you know, here's the thing. I uh, When we were talking about personal watercraft, I was thinking, where have I seen some good examples of this? Yeah. And, and I remembered, you know, flying many years ago, and in, uh, I fly all the time, but now, sure. they don't, now they don't have that Sky Mall magazine right. for me to thumb through anymore. Yeah. But when they did have Sky Mall, there was a company by the name of, and I hope I don't uh, botch this, but it's it's Hamaker Schlemmler. Yeah, Hamaker Schlemmer. Schlemmer, that's it. That's it. Hammaker Schlemmer. I'll just call it HS from now yeah. on. I decided I'd check out their website because I knew the company was still around. So right. I did I did that, searched for the word submarine or personal submarine or something like that. They make lots of toys for people who have way more money than oh, we do. Oh, yes. It's, yeah. a, it's a very expensive toy store for adults, right? right. And this is, a, uh, this is a list of the six personal submarine vehicles <laughs> that they have for sale right now, today. Yeah, they range, uh, as I'm looking at here, from uh, the low end is $90,000. Yeah, that's right. Now, the top end, the is, top end is a shocking $2.7 million. But you can fit five people in there. Well, that is a five-person submarine. You're right. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a big one that you were talking about before with some, more like a mini bus, I suppose. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're, you're shuttling a group of people. And the one that's $90,000 is that one that I believe most people have probably seen this already. It's the one that looks like a whale. It looks yeah. like an orca. Um, so... This one I've I've watched this one in action. It's got a it's got a gasoline motor. Yep. It's like a supercharged engine that you know you you have to use fuel for. And it can only go underwater briefly because gasoline motors also need oxygen. A- absolutely right. And there's a maximum depth of somewhere I'm going to ballpark this. I think it's around five feet because yeah. there's a snorkel on top that's disguised as a dorsal fin on this uh-huh. thing. And it does do you know the the uh, surface breaching right. where you know you can jump through the water. But you, and you can go underwater. The problem is when you go underwater, you have to be going so fast. You have to be because you have to, you know, have enough drive to to push yourself under the water and then it's, pop back out again. It's you know? exactly that forward momentum and, again. And, and I'm not saying this isn't really cool, but this right. isn't one of the subs like we're talking about where you can go under and kind of really get a look around. And it's very peaceful and everything. The, this is more like a jet ski that can take you underwater. Oh, absolutely. But you you're underwater and you're going 25 miles per hour when you're submerged, <laughs> and on the surface you can go as fast as 50 miles per hour. That's so crazy. It's fast. And it and it's it's clever looking. I mean, I agree. It's it really like neat. A killer whale. It really is cool, and it'd be fun yeah. to be able to do that jumping motion. But uh, it's not actually one of these, uh, you know, um, uh, I guess a sightseeing sub like some of the other ones we're talking about. And there's some weird designs here too. And if you if you look, I mean, there's the of course. I think most people are familiar with this one. You've seen, we've seen this one recently in the news a lot. Um, maybe not a lot, but the the submarine sports car is what they call it. It's two, <laughs> it's two million dollars. It looks like a Lotus Elise. And the problem with this one, though, is that it's it's all open to the to the water. Yeah, you're not inside an acrylic, you know, sphere or anything like yeah, the, you, like the rest of them. You are. have to wear scuba gear. Yeah, this one relies on scuba gear. It's it's what is called a wet submarine. They have wet submarines and dry submarines. And a wet submarine is any submersible. It's really people. Some people get really picky. They say you should call it a submersible, not a submarine. It's a submersible that the cockpit is open. It is exposed to the environment, which means that obviously if you're going to be underwater for any extended period of time, means you've got to be wearing scuba gear. Yeah. Uh, so you have to have your own personal oxygen supply and probably a mask of some sort unless you yeah. really are comfortable with your eyes stinging like crazy. I guess so, yeah. But the, the cool thing about this one, though, I mean, for that $2 million, you can also just drive that one right out of the lake or the uh, the ocean right. and go right on the street. It, it has a maximum speed on land of 75 miles per hour. So you can use it as a real car, an electric car. So it's like a super fast, uh, one of those super fast 
amphibious ducks yeah. you know, that take people on tours, except this one actually goes underwater. Well, it's 75 miles per hour on land, but underwater, you're, you're limited to about two knots when you're submerged. So it's not very yeah. quick underwater. Knots are um, nautical miles. And, and it's an electric car that only has an 80-mile range when you're on land, so it's it's fairly limited, limited in, yeah. that, in that situation. Well, for an eight, you know, I'm sorry, a $2 million car. So you're essentially putting it into the trailer of a truck, and then you're hauling it to the Yeah, somewhere near the seaside. beach. But what yeah. I do is I drive it near the beach, and then just for the show, you know, you drive right. it drive right onto the uh, onto the boat launch and right in the water. Uh, and if you're a real character, you might be like, oh, no, I've lost control. And you just slowly <laughs> drive right into the well, lake or ocean or whatever. And well, so, see you later, folks. Well, who wouldn't do that at least once, yeah. right? Yeah, now granted, it might be a little hard to understand you because you'll probably have some some like the you know the the rebreather, the scuba rebreather in your mouth. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, but uh, the effect will be there. Yeah, the effect would be there. And there's another one that's maybe uh, the most unusual looking one, really. And that's this one they call the amphibious subsurface watercraft. Oh yeah. And this is the one that I probably remember seeing in this magazine for years. It seems like an older design. Uh, this one has two parts to it and it doesn't really go as deep as you might expect either it's it's the, the well the top part floats like yeah. a, like a boat. So it's a boat and you can you know have your head up in the the upper area there it's also enclosed yep and it float it floats with that almost like a raft above him, above the water mm-hmm. below it is kind of this i guess it would hang down below the water surface and it's right. a, it's a sphere another mm-hmm. acrylic sphere where two people can sit and observe whatever's below you so it's kind of like a glass bottom boat, except that it actually has a, a secondary, almost like a secondary vehicle position below the primary one, and that one is under the water. Yes, and that has tracks as well. So this is another one that you can drive into the water and you know right onto a trailer if you want. Now it's it's not roadworthy. It's not something that you can take on you know the, the streets and drive you know to the ocean or sure. you know, whatever. You'd have to you'd have to get this one to the water. But you know with in the case with the other ones, you would have to find a dock or you'd have to find a crane. Something like that, or, right. or launch it from your super yacht, right. as you if, said, if right? You so to have a super yacht. They're even more, you know, difficult, more complex to launch than than would be one of these two that you can drive into the water. But, uh, man, I mean, that okay, that one we just talked about that uh, that subsurface watercraft. That's that's yeah. three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So you're still talking about not a, cheap. a pretty high entry price for something like this. Well, you know that Richard Branson, uh, he famously purchased a uh, a deep flight Merlin submersible. So same company that does the Deep Flight Challenger, which was the one that James Cameron took down to the uh, Mariana Trench, the deepest dive. He he did two of those, two deepest dives. Um, He uh, he got that one down there and was, uh, uh, you know, that that got all the news. But Richard Branson went out ahead and bought a Deep Flight Merlin, slightly different, uh, is a wet sub. So it's open cockpit, Mm -hmm. um, exposed to the ocean. That one, only $600,000. So only twice as much as the one you were looking at there. Um, and it was called the Necker Nymph. Strange name. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't ask questions. Yeah. I just read this, <laughs> the, the information. I uh, want to talk about a couple of others before we sign off, because we've we've got – there's so many that we could chat about that are ridiculous. There, there are two things that we've got to talk about. Okay. Thing number one. We started off this conversation early on. You talked about how there's a market for this because, as is evidence, there's a market for high-end, handmade luxury cars. We've talked about those in the past, like things like Bentleys and stuff. Sure. Aston Martin made a big announcement last year about how the company was partnering with the uh, the personal submarine company Triton to create a – new high-end luxury personal sub. And uh, so all we know is the bare minimum that Aston Martin has gotten involved in the design stage. We've seen a picture of the concept, although it's a computer generated image. It's not an actual prototype. Mm -hmm. Um, Not yet. Not yet. It is more of that floating orb style of submarine. It's less of like the sports car looking type thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's still in the concept stage. We have no idea how much it's going to cost, but if it's by Aston Martin, I would suspect pretty penny would be in the range. Well, I've seen uh, numbers around like, you know, ballpark four million dollars. That that to me is not at all surprising. Yeah, because you look at just Aston Martin sports cars, depending on the ones you're looking at, like the uh, the Aston Martin 177. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are only 77 of them ever made. 
These were supercars that uh, high end luxury supercars that could have a top speed of like 220 miles per hour. Those went for one point eight five million dollars a piece. And sure. Now there's only 76 of them. <laughs> there was a crash oh. in Hong Kong. Oh. We're down to 76 of those. Always hate to hear about that. Uh, Aston Martin AM dash RB zero zero one. Price tag of $3.9 million. That one does not go on sale until, well, this year, 2018. So, Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, I don't know if you've put aside any money. I've already got a down payment. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll have this paid off in 3,000 years. I have a a check ready to go. I just haven't signed it yet. There you go. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. (laughs) Well, you know, it's not as strange as you might think for Aston Martin to be involved with something like this. Uh, A lot of automakers have collaborated with uh, luxury yacht makers sure. to create some incredible super yachts yes. you know, that are powered by Lamborghini or powered by Bugatti, places yeah. like that. Well, Aston Martin has done this in the past as well. They have a well, 1,040 horsepower powerboat that I think it starts around 1.6 million. Wow. Uh, but it's a spectacular looking boat and it's, it's you know, a, a, I guess a break from the usual for them, you know, to do something like that. It's not something they normally do, but they have this new branch at Aston Martin now mm-hmm. that I, I I don't know if it's a branch. A branch is the best way to say it, but a new division maybe. Mm-hmm. And it's called Aston Martin Consulting. Right. So AMC, which I think is a funny name for Aston yes. Martin Consulting, given AMC, you know, Motors. Theaters. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, theaters. I was thinking. <laughs> that's funny. I was thinking American Motors. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they have all these side projects and they're doing things like um, – uh, they're creating uh, what furniture? They're creating. Yeah. Uh, they're designing really. It's, yeah. it's It's they're they're pairing up with other businesses that want to uh, you know get some of their expertise on design engineering. You know, a structural uh, um, um, stability, that kind of thing. You know, whatever. I'm, I'm searching for words here, but they're doing a bunch of really crazy things right now. Sure. For Aston Martin, you wouldn't think a, a typical car company would do something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing. Well, of course, this is one. One thing that they've tried is this uh, the submarine. Right. Another thing is Aston. They're, they're, in, they're getting into building residences. So Aston Martin is building residences in. I believe it's in. Um, I think it's in Miami. Let me take a quick wow. look here. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, the price is something like you know fifty million dollars though. Yeah, for, it doesn't for shock one me. of these. Yeah, and because you're going to find out that everything was made by hand, not on like an assembly line or anything <laughs> like that. And... Yeah, exactly right. It's a uh, but they're they're. It would ha- it has less of a uh, an Aston Martin uh, touch to it than you might think. You know, their oh. logo is not everywhere. It's just huh. simply that they're helping with the design of this uh, this ultra luxury condo, or you know, or I guess it's condos. I guess yeah. that would be the way to say it. But um, some of these penthouses are you know between um, you know up to nineteen thousand square feet. It's one of those types of places, really luxury, uh, a real luxury apartment, really, if you want to put yeah. it that way, or condo, um, which. I thought it was strange, but on the same page, they have a link to something called the Porsche Tower. So I I guess Porsche is also getting into this, and they've they've done something where they're going to create this building where you're going to be able to ride in your Porsche car or whatever car you have. It doesn't. They're not going to. They're not going to turn you away. No, again, they're just designed by uh, the Porsche Design Group, Mm -hmm. and you ride in a. This is the strangest thing. You ride in a glass elevator in your car up to your penthouse level suite. So you've got the floor. That's right. Every, but every, it's not just the penthouse level. It's every yeah. level. So, so it's your garage and home and everything is right there. Exactly right. And you're overlooking the ocean. It's a, it's, it's spectacular. It's I a guess. different so, world. Scott. It, it really is. You know, and I, um, again, look into those if you want to, but it's Aston Martin Residences. And then there's also the Porsche Design Tower if you want to want to check into that. But um, strange that a car company, traditional car company, mm-hmm. if you want to call it that, would, would be getting into designing – you know, furniture and submarines, and submarines and yachts. yachts. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. It's a it's a very strange thought. Well, the last thing I want to touch on, I mentioned it earlier at the very top of the show, the idea of concepts that, as far as we can tell, there are no examples of real world versions of that. There's a company called Migaloo, and Migaloo has everything from super yachts to super yacht submersibles, so essentially the super yacht version of a submarine, to even a semi-submerged island, artificial island that you could have to launch all your stuff off of for presumably a truly magnificent amount of money. Uh, One of the super yachts that they 
have uh, the M7, which I think is the largest one. Their mm-hmm. their super yachts range. The designs range from seventy two meters to two hundred eighty three meters in length. All right, I'm going to give that in feet if you don't mind. Sure. All right, I, it goes from two hundred and thirty six feet long at the smallest. Yep. Up to nine hundred and thirty feet long at the longest. Nine hundred thirty feet long. This is a submarine design we're talking about. Yeah. And I, I stress design because there are like lots of CGI renderings of this. Mm-hmm. But as far as I can tell, none have ever been built. Uh, the M7 has been estimated to cost at around $2.3 billion with uh-huh. a B. And these are the ones that you can configure as a, as a couple of different things, right? Oh, sure, okay, yeah. So, so the configurations are, you can you can configure it as a restaurant and bar yep. for between 24 and 36 guests. Yep. You can configure it as a, a conference or a business layout. So yep. you know, if you want to hold your, uh, your, your meetings under the sea, have at it. Yep. Uh, and you can also convert, uh, I guess, uh, have it have it laid out as a private submersible yacht. So you can you can cruise the world in your own private submersible yacht under the under the uh, the surface of the ocean. Yep. No one the wiser. You're traveling the world. You would have your. I mean, obviously, if you're that wealthy, you have your own dedicated crew that's mm-hmm. o- operating everything. It'd have to be a big crew too. Yeah. Uh, the, the various layouts can include things like an onboard gym, a spa, a cinema, a gaming room, a library, an elevator, because this is a big enough vehicle where you actually have to use an elevator to go up and down different decks, um, multiple bars, VIP suites, ridiculous designs. Now, as we said, there's no images, there are no images anywhere of any of these actually being built. These are all things like, we can do this for you. You just have to write us the check. Mm-hmm. So uh, it makes me wonder how a company like that stays in business, because obviously if they had ever built one, there'd be pictures everywhere. Oh, sure. Right? You, you couldn't get away with not having pictures. Yeah, check out the site. It's it's Migaloo. And yeah. if you if you want to do just a, a Google keyword search, you'll find that. And you can see all these different layouts that they have. And it's really, it's fantastic. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. When I first saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna, this is amazing. I've, ne- a, I've never seen one of these. A submarine with a helipad? Yeah, and then you realize that, well, every single one of these is a rendering. Yeah. Uh, Migaloo is an Austrian company. Mm-hmm. Fun fact. Hmm. Austria is a landlocked country. Yeah, yeah that's a little <laughs> tough for a for a sub company to make a living. <laughs> so, just saying, grain of salt. Yeah. I mean, it may just be that no one's written a check yet. Like, I'm not. I don't wish to say that the company itself is just all smoke and mirrors, right? I'm just saying that I can't find any evidence of any product ever coming out of it. But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't. So, so but this, how does it stay solvent? I have no idea. So this could be underwater vaporware. Could be. So, I mean, there's so much more we could talk about. We could all, obviously get into all the technical details, but that would require another episode. The interesting thing to me is that there are people who you know, that are interested enough and wealthy enough to actually make this a viable industry. Because otherwise, they w- these companies wouldn't exist. Some of them, like Migaloo, obviously seem to exist in the in the world of ideas, yeah. where we haven't seen any realization of that. But others, like the Deep Flight Company, Triton, they, they make these submarines. These are not theoretical; they're not hypothetical products. They actually do exist. You can, if you have the money, go and purchase them, get the training, and operate them yourself. Uh, and it's phenomenal to me again that it's a market big enough to support these companies, but yeah. it, it, it works. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, those, uh, those H&S personal subs earlier, yeah. all of those come with something that they call a comprehensive training. So oh, uh, it requires a lot of, a lot of effort, but if you want to rent a sub, uh, you can get one from Norway, Norway right now. They'll ship it anywhere in the world. The cost, you have to rent it for about a month and it wow. costs about 75,000 euro. I don't know. I didn't do the conversion. So yet, about exactly $100,000 right, somewhere so about, around there. It's so about $100,000 a month. So it's expensive. Yeah. But again, it's, it's a place called U-Boat Works, W-O-R-X, and they will ship it anywhere in the world. These are typically more like, um, um, you know, discovery submarines where they're, yeah. you know, they've got arms for uh, specimen samples and well, things I'm, like that. So I definitely want those. Yeah. Well, of course you would. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's possible that you can rent one. That's, that's the, the takeaway here is that, you know, the, the ocean is becoming, and, and even the Great Lakes or, you know, whatever body of water you're near is becoming more and more accessible to everybody yeah. because of these companies. And we know that only a very select few can afford to buy one, 
But sure, anybody can, you know, rent one for the day or the afternoon or an hour yeah. and, and get that experience. And, and I, I think that's what, you know, all the the owners of these companies are really excited about. Right. They're looking at the, the recreation uh, vendors out there, the ones that, again, cater to like cruise ships and yeah. stuff like that the, or, or pleasure uh, centers, places where people go to travel to have a, a holiday, a vacation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could definitely see that being a growing industry as well. It does give me some pause because anytime you're talking about increased activity around the oceans, you have to worry about the impact you're having on the environment. Most of these are at least clean vehicles and that they're using electricity and they're not dumping like harmful materials directly into the ocean. But there are other, you know, obviously direct uh, interference with things like coral reefs and stuff would be disastrous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure that most companies out there are doing their best to avoid that because that's their bread and butter, right? Without those environments that are so compelling, there's no reason for you to go and pay for the experience. So it's in their best interest to preserve the environment as best they can for their own business. The one so. I just mentioned from Norway, they they ship out a couple of people that come with the sub for the full month. Wow. So uh, you get, you know, a person that's in the sub with you, you know, controlling it. They're operating. Wait, here's you're, your sub you're and here's your Sven. You're riding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's someone on the surface that they always, they maintain constant contact with. Well, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's, yeah. uh, you've, you've got, you know, specialized especially trained people there with you at right. all times. So it's the only responsible way to do really it. Really important. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll, I know what to save up for for my next birthday. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, well, my I next birthday I, better not happen till like 2040. But <laughs> I, I was going to give you a, I was going to give you a gift card at Chili's, but I guess maybe, yeah. uh, maybe I can't do you that know, anymore. I, I could go for a good appetizer. I'll just, uh, we'll stick with it. I'll stick just with write it. you a check. <laughs> Right. All right. Scott's writing checks, everybody. That's yeah, what we've learned from this episode. Put it toward the bigger goal, you know? Gosh, Scott. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show again. I really appreciate you joining us and, and chatting about all things submarine and, and uh, luxury oriented where we can sit here and dream of a life that uh, I suspect I will never get a direct glimpse into. <laughs> well, thanks for having me again. I uh, I always enjoy our, our conversations. And uh, guys, if you haven't listened, now the, the show has sadly come to an end after a, a monumental run, but Car Stuff is an amazing podcast. And all those episodes are still available for you to listen to. Yeah, we have a huge archive. It's uh, it's approaching 900 episodes. I didn't have an actual actual count, but we yeah. we were on air for just over nine years. Yeah. And that's a, uh, that's a lot of automotive topics. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you should definitely check that out if you haven't heard it before, because you guys, you guys have covered all sorts of things, everything from minutia about specific car companies to general problems that people can uh, experience with vehicles and how to to work around that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And even the just the evolution of the industry itself. I mean, we've seen cars go from something where the average person with a little bit of hard work and study could learn how to work on their own car and tinker with it to a world now where cars are becoming more and more like a black box where it's all locked away from the consumer and it's getting increasingly difficult to do even the simplest of car maintenance work on a vehicle yourself if you have a brand new one and that I know I wait no I said I wasn't going to I said I wasn't going to do that to you didn't I that I wasn't going to get you with a gotcha no, that's, okay, right. well, that's no that's not my fault that's not my fault I, I want I want the days where you could just get your vehicle and you could learn how to how to how to tinker with it yourself hmm. I think those are I think there's a value to that. So. That wasn't a gotcha moment, by the way. Yeah, that's no, okay. I, I knew that was coming. I yeah. realized I realized as I was going down that path, I'm like, whoa, dangerously close. So we're just going <laughs> to wrap it up here. Yeah, yeah. Guys, if you have any suggestions, questions, comments, you got a request for a specific episode topic, or maybe there's someone you would like me to have on the show, get in touch with me because that's, that's how I find out about those sort of things. You can write to me. The email address for the show is techstuff at howstuffworks.com or drop me a line on Facebook or Twitter. The handle for both of those is techstuffhsw. We're on Instagram now and Crystal's doing a killer job over there. So you've got to go over to Instagram, find tech stuff over there, join us in that group. And remember, I live stream recordings of this episode whenever I'm not interviewing somebody on Wednesdays and Fridays. So just go to twitch.tv slash tech stuff. You'll find the schedule.